Hello and welcome to the conversation. I'm Stephanie Rivers and this is K-Town Icons. It's a podcast that speaks to and highlights notable people who grew up in or lived in Knoxville, Tennessee. Again, I'm Stephanie Rivers. I'm the host and co-producer of the podcast. Now, today's guest, he is Silk Cozart. He's an actor, director, writer, and producer, and he has appeared in over 30 films and 20 television shows. In his prime, he you might have seen him in uh, movies like 16 Blocks or with Bruce Willis and Most Dev. You might have seen him in White Men Can't Jump with Wesley Snipes and Woody Harrelson. That's just the name, too of his uh, well-known flicks. Now, today he's right here with me. He's stopping by to bless the podcast. Let's welcome Silk Cozart to the conversation. Welcome to the show. Hi, Stephanie. How you doing, honey? Happy Easter. Exactly. Happy Easter to you. I appreciate you taking time out during um, this Easter weekend. Um, to stop by so we can have a conversation. Now, before we get started, I did want to um, pay homage to um, Hollywood icon Louis Gossett Jr., who died recently. Um, He is, uh, his acting uh, career spanned more than 50 years, and some people might best know him as being in an officer and a gentleman, and um, before that a couple of weeks ago, of course, um, we had uh, Richard Roundtree to pass. He was best known for his role in um, as Shaft. Two of Black Hollywood legends have passed on, so I wanted to make sure we um, acknowledge them um, before we moved on. Um, and let's just start it off right there, Silk. Um, Who were some of the acting um, role models that influenced your your career? Well, Stephanie, you kicked it off perfect because Lou Gossett Jr. was one of my mentors. And uh, it's been very difficult for me the last couple of days. And his son, Sati, is a friend of mine. And, you know, just I feel for the whole family. So this is not um, just somebody I met and then enjoy their work. And I did. Um, Lou... I can't tell you what all he meant to me or means to me. Um, So if my eyes are a little little blurry, it's because I just, I I get, he just meant so much to me. So I wanted to make, I wanted to dedicate this, this particular podcast from me to, to him and his family, um, whatever that means. And, um, but yeah, so Louis Gossett Jr. was, was one of the most important people in my life as far as my career is concerned. And um, along, along, also Denzel uh, Washington is. Um, it will always be like the person that just gave me so much inspiration and and knowledge and great nuggets, as we say that you know uh, that we spread around. Um, he got he kept me out of a lot of trouble when I first moved to Hollywood. You know what I mean? He he oh, always he- said you can't be framed. If you're not in the picture. <laughs> so, you know, when I was out there first, I said, oh, I got to go to this party or that party. This director's going to be this. He goes, how many times you've been hired from going to a party? <laughs> and I was mm-hmm. like, uh, well, there was that one. No, there was. So never. So he said, go to a party to have a good time. And that's it. Don't go expect anything, you know, like that. You audition, you do it, you get hired. Then they know you work then they just hire you from what you've been working on. And that's the way it is. And I was able to relay that kind of knowledge and wisdom to a lot of the young actors coming up, you know, behind me. And I would say, why do you want to go to this party so much? (laughs) Or why do this director or producer wants to take you to breakfast or lunch? Um, Go if you're hungry. (laughs) You know, don't go expecting a job. You know, and so I that taught me a lot. So Denzel and um, and Lou were are just extremely, um, you know, I owe them a lot, a lot. 
Well, now we know that now most people have dreams of being in movies and or dreams of being a star um, athlete. You were blessed to uh, have both talents. Um, you could have been a top ranked basketball player, I, I hear. What's that about? Tell us well, about that. Well, you know, unless uh, when I came up in the 70s back in the day, um, yeah, an NBA try, an NBA uh, draft was like it went to to ten rounds. Right now, if if you don't go first round, everything else is basically a tryout. <laughs> but when I was coming up, it was, it was really tough if you didn't go to a major school. You know, like Leroy Thompson went to Penn State. You know, you're on you're playing on television every week. You know, so I I went to a small. Uh, junior college, Montreat Anderson Junior College, and uh, in North Carolina, right outside of Asheville, because my grades wasn't the best, uh, you know, in high school. I was just kind of, I didn't like high school. The it was very tough for me in Carnes. You know, I didn't. I had to play against Austin East, and all my cousins would be on the team and friends that I I'd see on the weekends, right? And I'd have to go back to the country, <laughs> and Carnes, you know, after that, and then I have to play against them. And they tried to kill me, man. They tried to kill me in basketball and football. So, uh, you know, kind of like Leroy, I was, I was tested at a very young age. So basketball became the one I thought I could go the furthest. I, I loved football, but the football coach wouldn't let me play my natural position, which was quarterback. They already had their quarterback, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, so I played wherever I could. And I had more scholarship offers for football than I did basketball because nobody knew me. So when I got to try out uh, for a team, then I became a lot better. I got better and better. And the other thing is I came in during that, that late 60s thing where busing had just started in the late 60s, 68, 69. I was bused to Carnes High and there was only maybe one or two uh, black folks that worked there. And so, and I was two years younger than everybody in my grade. So when I was a senior, I was supposed to be a sophomore and, but they didn't check then. And I didn't, I didn't think anything about it, but as a 13 year old freshman, <laughs> you know, I was playing against guys who were 18 and some 19 and out here in cars are some 21 year old seniors. <laughs> but the point is it did well for me because I got to play at a high level early. So when I, got to play with people my age, I, it, I was like, you know, it was like kind of easy, but they wouldn't let me play my senior year at Carnes because they thought I was dating a white girl, which was uh, interesting because I hadn't been on a date since I was, until I was in college, but it was a big deal if, if people mixed in any kind of way at that time, during that time, and I didn't realize that. I was just playing ball and jealousy and all that. So I, I was dealt those kind of cards early. So when I, by the time I got to Hollywood, Hollywood ain't, it was like nothing to me uh, compared to what I went through, you know, out here. So that, that taught me a valuable lesson. Very valuable. So, well, you, so you decided that you, you picked basketball over football and then I understand that you also were a model. So what is that what what took you to to, to Hollywood to be a model first? No, I uh, I got hurt trying out for with the Denver Nuggets squad. I went to an NBA summer league and got picked out of the summer league to try out for, you know, the NBA scouts. All the teams would have scouts at that uh, summer league. They would pick out of 600, 800 people, they would pick about 80. And then the next few weeks, they would pick another 80 out of another six or 700 people coming in from Europe and all over the United States that didn't make the NBA that year or the year before or the year before that. So it was a constant battle. So I was picked, but I got hurt at Denver's camp. And um, instead of wanting to come back home, come back to Knoxville and lick my wounds, I you know, I thought, what? Well, you know, I don't want to come back. I thought I failed, you know, and had this crazy injury. I fractured my foot, so I couldn't play. So I was just <laughs> sitting. I was like, I'm not going to just sit here. So a friend of mine said that her aunt ran a modeling 
agency in Miami. And I'd never been really been there. And so she convinced me to just drive out there. So I, I had a cast on my left foot, and just from my calf and to my foot and over my foot. And I, so I couldn't do too much. So I would hang out at the beach. So finally, I went to an agency and they signed me, uh, Michelle Pommier agency. They also had Cindy Crawford that year. So she and I came in about the same time. And you know how different looks every five to 10 years, they, you know, they want the light skin here. They want the dark skin here. They want the this here. They want the mixed looking here. And every whatever, so often there's different looks, right, that's right. in or out. Um, so while I was coming up, um, there was no, <laughs> I didn't know what look was in or out, but I, but I got to work a lot. And so that got me, uh, you know, in magazines and got to travel around the world. You know, I'd never been to uh, Europe. I got to go to, you know, France and Italy and just fell in love, not just with the city, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not just with the country, just with everything about it. So when I got back, I wanted to act since I was a kid from being in church plays and things like that. Like most most kids do, I think one, like you said, want to uh, to be an actor or want to be an athlete or any of that. And I got to really do that. And it's like you I feel like I'm living my childhood uh, dreams, you know. So by the time I got to Hollywood, it wasn't really. Uh, uncomfortable, you know, it didn't, I wasn't, it, I wasn't, I didn't seem to be intimidated with the things that most people were intimidated with. I didn't understand. Why would you be nervous going into an audition? This is an audition. If they like me, they like me. If they don't, okay, next. So I had that kind of attitude going in, which really helped me. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I just kind of blocked out things that didn't help me. You know, mm -hmm. kind of eliminated all the things you don't need and what's left is what you got and what you need. And it, it really helped me. Plus, I had a really strong relationship with the people that raised me. Uh, they were like grandparents to me. And my mom, uh, she had me when she was really she's 16 years old, 16, 17. At the, I think right when I was born, she was right in. There. And so you got a baby having a baby, you know, and so. um if she hadn't have been the strong girl, young woman, woman uh, that helped me get through those tough years because she protected me, which allowed me to develop. And she was able to put me in a household of, and they were family. They were like, uh, they were my uh, father's aunt and uncle. So they were like my great, they were like great grand, they were like grandparents basically. And, it gave me a certain um, foundation. So by the time I got to Hollywood, um, it was just like going to Oak Ridge. <laughs> I mean, really. And I would meet stars all the time, but I'd be like, hey man, I like your work. And they, and they were like waiting on me to get an autograph or something. I'm like, mm, no, I don't want your autograph. I don't need your autograph. I was just going to give you a pound, you know, like good stuff, you know, but um, I, sir, I soon saw it was such an image based business. So you had to make sure, like Denzel said, you ain't gonna get framed if you ain't if you ain't in the picture. Just don't go to those a lot of those parties. And now we see how they're trying to tear down, especially Black Hollywood. And everybody that made it big didn't go to those and do those things. But you could just be innocently at a party at a a house or at an institution that's having a party that somebody in that building was doing something you didn't know anything about, right? And it comes on the news that this was happening. You're like, wait a minute. I thought my friend so-and-so was there. And you call him, you go, did you go to that thing? Yeah. The news, you see what's going on? Oh, I didn't do that. I'm not, well, yeah, you're going to be associated with it now. So I learned not to just go anywhere that sound or looked good, you know? So, so thanks you know again, what? Denzel. <laughs> I, um, and I was going to well, ask. I can't hear you. you. Hold on. Um, Are you hearing me? Oh, now all of a sudden I cannot hear you. Hello. Hello. Are you there now? 
Well, while he's trying to get that together, uh, we are talking to Silk Cozart oh. on oh, well. uh, conversations yeah, with K-Town icons. Silk, are you hearing me? You might need to go out and then come back in. He's trying to work on it. Um, so what we uh, we started this podcast, Katusha Kroom and I, because a lot of people, um, she's currently working in the school system, uh, being a teacher, teacher's assistant. I'm not sure exactly what her position is, but you know, we got into this conversation where she talked about how some of the students that she's working with currently, um, they don't see themselves beyond their uh, neighborhood. And so we thought, how can we let them know that there are people who sat in those same, walk the same halls that they're walking and um, have Jeez. gone on to better things. You know, it's no problem if you want to stay in Knoxville, if you want to do whatever you want to do, but the possibilities are there for you. So Katusha Kroom and I, who also um, has her own Hollywood story to tell, um, she has worked as a writer and producer and screenwriter for some of the um, notable people in Hollywood as well. She and I um, she and I decided to do this podcast. So we are talking with um, K-Town icon Silk Cozart. And as you can see from the previous, for, for what we discussed so far, um, he essentially um, has started out in, um, in sports because most kids get involved in sports or some extracurricular activities in school. And then that he went to the Denver Nuggets um, for a trial. I had no idea. Um, that he was that good, let alone he went to a um, Denver Nuggets tryout, broke his foot, had to do something else, ended up going to model, and um, from there ended up in Hollywood. So I am going to, I think he has come back in. Um, okay, Silk, I don't know if you're hearing me, but- I, Can you hear me? I, yes, yes. Okay, but I'm I don't to, see yeah, I'm trying to get the uh, video. I must have hit a- Hit something, I don't know, uh, on the phone. Uh, okay, yeah, you got to flip it because we're looking at some books right yeah, now. Yeah, I know, I know, right? I'm like, uh, but how about now? I can't see you. I just see a phone. So can you see yeah, this? Okay? Yeah. Is this okay? Yes, yes, right, I we'll can just, see you. Okay, we'll just, how's that? Yeah, that's good. So I'm going to bring you back in. Okay, and then good. We've got a, um, we've got a, uh, someone in the chat saying, um, this is, Ava Dupree Holmes saying, hey, oh. Steph. So you you probably know at, uh, Ava and, yeah. and all of those. Uh, and her uh, brother. And, and she's just so cool. She's like so cool. She's very smart, very talented, and just a really kind individual. I haven't seen Ava in a long time. As a matter of fact, I think she, she moved to Los Angeles, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got to hang out a little bit. We got to go to a bunch of events together. Then you know how it is. You get pulled here and pulled there, and years go by, you know? But correct, yeah. correct. So <laughs> you left off with um, talking about, and I, I had planned to ask you about family, um, because, you know, when we're growing up, a lot of what we get involved with or what we're able to pursue depends on the dedication of your family having to take you to practice, take you to auditions to keep you going before you realize the possibilities. So your your family was very supportive in that um, in, in that arena they, for you. Not not they, they were supportive in the early years of of my upbringing, you know, as uh, far as making sure I was safe and had food and a place to stay. But uh, when, when I left the nest, there was no family around, nobody. It was just me in L.A. and then developed a few people, a few friends along the way. But having that family in the beginning, the, before I left, I can't tell you how important that was. It, it gave me that confidence that one needs in Hollywood or wherever you, you're going to go pursue uh, your career. Uh, I don't care who you are, you're going to be overwhelmed at some point when you get to a certain level. Um, and there's, I see how a lot of people can get trapped 
you know, and we're reading about them now. And when things that they did 20 years ago, they didn't think about, you know, the internet, <laughs> you know, right. capturing all that, you know, but just, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand how people can not want to find people that have been there before them, if that's what they want to do, uh, and, and put yourself in that arena. You know, that's, mm -hmm. if you want to perform in that arena, put yourself in that arena, you know, um, and there's ways to do it. There's no one way to do anything. That's so, my experience. That's what I found. So having um, uh, mentors is important. Extremely, extremely. And they don't just come out of the sky. You know, that's the thing. You don't just walk around and find a mentor. You, you have to want that. You have to. Uh, no, you need someone a lot smarter than you <laughs> that's done it before you. Why would you not want to, you know, like if, if, if you had never had done a podcast before and didn't look at any other podcast or watch people the way they did it, you know, it might take you a while, you know, but if you have a mentor or someone that's done it and they kind of walk you through some things and kind of show you this or that and then you go out on your own. It's such a difference. I mean, it's such a big difference, you know, and that's why the transition from sports to the entertainment business seemed like it wasn't a, that much of a difference to me. Because when you're playing ball, you know, you, you're playing in front of audience. It's like theater. You know, you do a play. It's, you know, and you have a, a director, a coach. It's like a coach. You have players. You have co-stars. You have the stars and uh you said something in the beginning i think in your cult opening uh that you said uh, in his prime he did this white man all those i don't feel like i've reached my prime yet if you really want to know the truth um and i hope that doesn't sound you know any other way than what it is is i i think we constantly grow and we get better in things i mean we it's like when somebody says who's the best basketball player in the world what era you can't just say one player unless if you do it's michael jordan <laughs> i know that nobody i mean you can argue but there's no way anybody was better than him no there's no way i don't care what anybody says the stats prove it everything proves it it's like science if you can't prove it then it's you just hoping something you know you're just guessing but anyway that's another story <laughs> so i was able what what I thought was very unique about my journey is that playing ball, I could play at a certain level. I could play at an NBA level and know it. All my friends knew it. I played against a lot of NBA guys. They were like, you know, wanting me to be in the league even after I got hurt, you know. I mean, Elston Turner, who we grew up together, you know, and we we went at it every day before he even went, before, while we were in high school, you know, before he went to, to college, before I went to, so you play against guys like that. Uh, there's a guy named, um, let's see, uh, Rupert Breedlove. He was the biggest guy I'd ever seen in my life. He was from Knoxville. He's like seven footer, um, gotten in some trouble, but he was like an extremely, he was a monster. So I was playing against him at 13, you know? So by the time I got to doing a movie with Shaq, when we did uh blue chips, okay, you're seven, two. I just got to shoot a little higher over you. <laughs> right. So it really depends on those early years what you're exposed to. And that's why I love working with kids of all ages, because if you expose children to math at a certain early age, it's not gonna be so big of a deal by the time they get to junior high or high school. I wasn't exposed to it. I got behind because I was already two years younger than everybody in my grade, but I didn't realize it until maybe middle of high school. But most people don't have to, don't go through that. Uh, so by the time I got to college, and I went to some hard college. I mean, they were academically to me, <laughs> I was struggling. I mean, it was tough. It was tough to keep that that scholarship on all of them because King College, where I graduated, they have they're known for doctors, lawyers, you know. And I'm going because I love the coach. <laughs> you know, and I get there and I'm like, um, wait a minute, what can you go over that again? <laughs> they were like, no. You're supposed to know that before you get here. Anyway, so it was 
eye opening to my, my freshman year in college was the most frightening, most difficult thing. Here I am barely six, 16, 17 years old, not even 17. Oh, I'm 17 in, in college, and, but never hadn't gone outside of Knoxville. And then I'm, that's but I like North Carolina because it reminded me of Knoxville. Montreal Anderson, you know, Asheville is right, you know, a couple hours away. Um, and I always thought I'd get out of college, play uh, in the NBA for 10 years and go right into acting. And after acting about 10 years, win Academy Award, <laughs> go into directing, win Academy Award, and then just start living, uh, bringing up a lot of other actors and directors and, and people at that point. I wrote it out as that when I was 10. I wrote out that I was getting those exactly 10 year increments and uh, didn't quite happen exactly like that, but I have no complaints and just uh, God sometimes puts you exactly where you say you want to be. Now it's up to you. <laughs> yeah. Amen. So in, in, in speaking of Oscar winning, um, I, well, I, you probably know this too, but when actor Jamie Foxx accepted his Oscar for the lead role in the movie Ray, he said that he arrived in LA with two talents. He start, he wanted to sing, make his mark in singing. Um, but after he won the Oscar, he said he would now focus on, uh, acting. So what was your breakout role that made you say this acting thing is going to work out? You know, it wasn't, that's a great question. It wasn't a particular movie or a role. It was a particular individual, different individuals that were already in the industry that you probably never heard of, you know, just different people along the way that actually recognized um, some, some qualities that I might have and convinced me to hone these things and acting is a you know it's an art you don't just wake up and be an actor i mean you can wake up and have certain qualities that are natural you know but it's an art you still it, it, if it was that easy everybody would do it everybody could do it but it's not and and then you learn that other people might have other ideas than you have <laughs> you learn to work in within an environment that from people from all over the world different races different nationalities and everything and that just strengthens you it gives you a better arsenal, a bunch of arsenals to use when you're playing different characters. And it's all related. I, I just directed a movie called Inherit the Land. It's, an, it's a documentary and we're getting ready. It's getting ready to go into distribution. And I'll let you know before it, where it goes. But and, and I wrote the um, screenplay from a book. But um, what I was doing was showing your uh, Facebook page of all some of the um, movies that you have been in. And of course we said, um, White Men Can't Jump, 16 Blocks. What was that movie you were in with um, with um, Mel, Mel, Mel Gibson that you have on your page? It was, it was called Conspiracy Theory. Conspiracy Theory, okay. Yeah. The same so director, you... uh, Richard Donner, who did, uh, he directed Superman, you know, and all the lethal weapons. Um, and his name is Dick Donner. So he, he brought me, uh, with the Bruce Willis film, 16 blocks and then, um, um, uh, conspiracy theory with Mel Gibson and Julia Roberts, just great people, wonderful people. So now of course, you know, people are trying to, um, figure out how to break into the business. Um, and I know most with most things, there's a protocol that has to happen. Um, but when it comes to acting, uh, cause I keep getting these calls or these emails from companies that claim to, you know, if you pay us a certain amount of money, we'll put together your, um, your, uh, acting resume, your headshot and all of that. And then we'll put you in front of the people. So what's the process? Do you need an agent? Can you just show up to an audition? Um, you know, there's all these different ways for you to get into the business. What would you, if somebody wanted to get your advice, what would you suggest? Well, I think there's more ways not to do it <laughs> than to do it. So I don't want to go into all the things what you should not do, but I, 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 some things you just don't do. First of all, just showing up, no, uh, because that 
you know, usually when people are auditioning, they're on a time schedule. So they might like, you might be great. You might even be right for the part, but you've, you've disrupted, interrupted their flow of what they're doing. You know, it's, it's tension anyway, because you're using millions of dollars in a lot of cases. So they don't have time just to, if it was that way, everybody would do it, you know, and there's nothing wrong with signing with an agency that will take, if, if they will set you up with the pictures, you have to have photos, you have to have a video of your work. If you don't have any videos or any um, scenes that you've done, whether they are a play or a movie or a TV show or even a commercial, then the aud auditioners don't know what you can do. Um, so you have to develop a tape in order to give to your agent your agent's not responsible for making your tapes, you know. There's agencies that help you do that. But most, like I said, you want to put yourself in that environment. So if you don't have a, a movie scene or reel, you have to put one together. That's that's one thing. But I tell everybody that, that starts out to do a play. Do a play. Because you'll know if you like the theater, or better yet, if the theater likes you. Because you'll know when you're on that stage, <laughs> it'll it, it'll tell you if you're in the right place or not <laughs> i when i my first play i saw a play when i was like god i think i was maybe nine and it was a bad play but i didn't know that i just said i don't believe that that's fake <laughs> or so but it was a bad play now 10 years mm -hmm. later i go i'm in new york and i i'm on an off-broadway play and i'm mesmerized i wanted to jump up on stage you know, but it was a great play. So then I saw the difference in, oh, good acting, bad acting, great acting, horrible acting, great writing, horrible writing. I used to wonder, how do you decipher which one, you know, uh, but there, the more you do, the more you, you learn. And I think just getting right in it, do a play is what I would tell, do a play a high, at, a, at a theater, a local theater. Uh, that's because everything started from the pl a play. That was the first educators. They would go to another country and come back to your country and and show you how the they talked and the foods that they made and how they dressed and how they uh, handled situations. And that just kept giving you more information on how to build characters. And w with this business, it's all connected. And what I was getting ready to say before we um, before I messed up this technical thing. <laughs> Uh, it, when the journalists were asking me, how do you write the song? You sung the lead, uh, you narrated, you directed. How do you do all those things? And I said, well, I don't look at it as all those things. I look at it as one. They're all one. It's like in a meal, you know, you got chicken, rice, you got maybe soup and salad before, you got dessert. You can make all those things, right? And right. you can have help to, to make all those things. So you have to know how to prepare. And I was raised by a chef, by the way. <laughs> so, okay. I, yeah. So anyway, but that's how I look at it. Everybody looks at things different. And that's good. We need different. It's like music. The music industry is like, to me, uh, it's not many people creating music. They're recreating what's been out there and what's been over the years, which is, that's talent. It takes talent to do that. But the people that originated those songs, Marvin Gaye didn't, he, he might've loved Sam Cooke, but he wasn't trying to be Sam. He was doing what he felt. Barbara Streisand didn't, didn't try to sound, she's not trying to be somebody else. And actors, the same thing. You know, I had a guy, I teach acting, right? So I, I master class. And one of the one of the guys, he was a, a baseball player, and he was a really good baseball player. So his family said, "Oh, you could be an actor. Oh, you should do this because you're great in baseball." Well, he comes to my class, and I don't pull punches because I, I I don't I don't want people to go out there and think it's easy, and then they get you know like Mike Tyson said, everybody thinks they can fight until they get hit in the mouth. <laughs> you <Right>. know, <laughs> so I, I I try to give them little tabs and and where it don't hurt them, but it, it wakes them up, uh, hitting them in the mouth. Not literally, but you know, I let them know that that wasn't, no, that it's nothing's not bad. It's just, this can be better. 
So when you, it's not mistakes. You don't make mistakes when in my class, there's no mistakes. It's like you do this thing. Now we can do it. Let's do it better. It's not bad. Nothing's bad. So we eliminate all the stuff that gets people, um, you know, insecure right away, especially the young actors or new actors. There's, there's people in their sixties and seventies that are new actors, you know? So, uh, that, I don't know if I might've went off the, the subject there for a little bit, but, um, well, I, I want to ask, I want to ask you, um, so what if someone wants to take your class? Do you have a website for that? How would they find out more about taking your acting classes? Well, I, I've been teaching private for years because I don't particularly think we can learn as much when there's 30, 40 people in, in the, in a room. Um, I think you can learn some things, but I think that you, you got to be one on one with a lot of people and then develop a a body of a, a body of people. So you then you can put them together because everybody's going to need something different. I might need to learn how to memorize script. I might she might need to learn how to break down a character. Um, he might need to learn how to develop a character or everybody needs something different. And there's no way. Then you're talking to 30 people and 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 really help each one of those. I like the the one on one uh, private lessons for the first, say, four lessons. And then we put them in an environment with other folks. So I, I'm I'm pretty different about that. I, I, I'm very tough. I don't I don't particularly care for a lot of these acting acting teachers. It's never acted. Can you imagine going to a doctor? This, you know, you got to have brain surgery. And this guy says, hey, you know, I always wanted to be a brain surgeon. You know, I, I can help you out. I can do that. I can do it, man. I can do it. You don't believe in me? No, I don't. I really so then if someone wanted to, so they can just reach out to you on, on Facebook. Uh, your Facebook page. And then, yeah, you can and, then I'll, and then we'll meet. We'll have a meeting vir virtual or even meet for a coffee or either I have them come to my studio here um, in off of Millbrook Pike. And we'll have a session and I'll see where they where they are. A lot of people can just show up to classes not knowing what are you there? For? What kind of classes are you taking? You know, and what's offered? A lot of people just waste their money. And I don't believe in that. I'm not doing this. I don't do it for money. I do it because I love developing talent. You know, nobody really helped me in those early stages, those crucial crucial times in the early stages that we need and by the time you get to hollywood everybody's like hey you on your own man you know and, and i really denzel I, that's why i love him so much he he's so secure with himself i met so many people black white asian Hispanic, all kind it didn't matter they were so insecure so it didn't help you because they felt like well if i help him he might get the role or he might get you know bigger than me a lot of, and a lot of our folks did that to me and I watched them do it to each other and other people. And I always said, when I get to be, <laughs> you know, when I get to be there, I'm not going to do that. And, and I've held on to that. I help as many people as I can. If they're serious, they, if it's somebody just, Oh, I think I'll try acting. I'm not the guy. There's people that can help you do that. I mean, I could help them, but to me, it's not utilizing what I have to offer. You know, so I cut right to what that person needs. And sometimes you have to strip away what that person has learned. If they've learned the wrong way, let's just say you tell somebody, I need six holes dug in that in the yard there. I'm planting these trees. Well, if you just go in and start digging holes and, and I come back and I go, um, you didn't ask me where the, uh, you know, I was supposed to tell you where the holes were. You just started. You, you worked hard, but you worked not effectively now you got to redo that and all that so i cut out all that and get right to what that person needs you know it's like i learned from all the great directors about that and speaking of great directors you know some people have what they call um a list of people that they will they that they want to work with yeah. and that they absolutely refuse to work with so um who are some of the most difficult a-list actors that you've worked with uh, or directors and why who's on your i will never work with that person again in life 
list? <laughs> well, it's, that's another word that is hard for me to say. Is two words is hard for me to say. Is it's easy and never. <laughs> uh, you know, I might have said them, but I don't. I don't really like those words. But there's quite a few that. I mean, the list is is very long with that you the people you don't want to work with because um, of one reason or another. It's not because they're not talented. It's not because they don't uh, they're not really good at what they do. But I'm a big stickler on how you treat people. You know, if if um, let's just say you're working on a film and and an actor <coughs> Chevy Chase <coughs> was um, uh, kind of difficult. And uh, you just, they don't talk to you. They don't talk to anybody. And like, there's no reason for that. You could say hello, you know, without, you know, spending a whole day with somebody. You just, if somebody speaks to you, you, just speak back. Some actors and some directors won't even acknowledge anybody other than the main star or the producer or the person that's funding the project. And to me, that sends a mix, a bad signal, you know, and it, it starts out. Really, I hate naming a lot of people. I can name the people I really like. <laughs> and I and, and you know what? On that note, though, I was looking at, um, and I'll just say this, you know, a lot of people are saying you might have seen the Cat Williams interview on Shay Shay podcast. Oh, yeah. And um, of course, um, I know Cat Moby came after that. And, you know, people started talking about their experiences with um, Steve Harvey and how they um they said one of the people in the chat said they were on his security team and how he wouldn't even speak to them he wouldn't acknowledge them and this person is you know a part of it so someone else said well did you want him to be your friend and you know the response was i wasn't asking him to be my friend just be cordial and speak and say hello and you know just it's like that simple it doesn't take a lot to just be cordial and be humane to people and acknowledge people exactly point taken and there's i can name you a few <laughs> actors and actresses that you work with them you're on the set they make specific instructions to the the pas the production assistants they'll come to different people and they'll say don't ask her any questions don't look in her eyes you know and all this oh, stuff no. and you're like wow you know wow that's really an insecure person whether you're a great star or whatever you're still an insecure individual to say to have people do that you know why are you doing i mean you can't speak you can't say hello and if you're getting harassed you know you set yourself you know with security and you only come out when you need but not just because you think you're all that you know because the next day you can not be all that you know right. it's it's a lot it's this business is very humbling very humbling to the non-white uh uh actors uh celebrities entertainers whatever you want to call them. It's just not, it's just the way it is. You know, we could, it, it's just the way it is. And so, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, it seems like you are reading my question list because my next question is there's recent talk about black actors being underpaid. And you might have seen Taraji P. Henson. Um, she's like the person who spoke out recently, says she has been underpaid most of her career. Um, an Emmy Award winner Viola Davis talks about it even. And Terrence Howard admitted that he only got paid $12,000 for the role in the acclaimed movie hustle and flow. So That's did correct. you feel as if your pay was comparable to A-listers that you worked with um, alongside in some of those movies or was it considerably less? It was considerably less because it was either you either take it or you don't. And, um, you know, you, you got to eat. <laughs> and so I started um, again. I, I, I reach back to my roots, to my upbringing. Um, you know, I was born on, you know, I was raised on a farm, you know, kind of like a farm, you know, just very basic, simple life. So I didn't feel like I needed a lot of things and stuff. So I didn't, um, I didn't request a lot of things. I, as long as I had 
you know, if my bills were paid and and my family was taken care of. I'm good. Anything after that was dessert. So I had that kind of going into it. But then when I saw the pay scale, how it was such a different scale from from them, I thought, wow, it's like swimming in an ocean. You can't fight, you know, the wave. If you fight the wave, you will lose every time because the wave will just keep going. But if you relax and and ride with the wave, find a way to ride with the wave. It's not just one way. So once you find that way, then you can enjoy the the journey instead of trying to fight against it every time you go out to the wave. So I looked at it like that. So if I had a friend, uh, Matthew Perry, who passed away not too long ago, we did a movie called Three to Tango. And he came up to me when we were in Toronto filming. He's Canadian and Neff Campbell's Canadian. So we filmed in Toronto and he came up to me after like the second week of filming. And uh, he says, I just got F you money. <laughs> I went, what? I just got F you money. And I'd never heard that term. You know what I mean? Um, and I said, well, what's that? He goes, enough money to say you. And I was like, I said, Matt, what are you talking about? He goes, I just got, I'm getting a million dollars a week of a, a show. Wow. Said, for, for friends? He goes, yeah. And he says, I'm going to make sure the cast gets their money too. And I said, wow. Now, before that, he was making, you know, a couple hundred grand, which is a lot a, a week. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm like, most people don't make that in their lifetime, what he made in a week. So, uh, was he worth it? Yeah. Uh, was anybody else worth it? Yeah. But I had the same folks before that. We did a show called um, Living Single, where Queen Latifah, uh, they didn't have a series. They just had a pilot, one show. That show had to be really good, or they wasn't going to get 12 more episodes for a season. So they fired. Okay. You're back. So okay. I, what I thought was, was important was... You, you you mentioned swimming against the the tide or trying to enjoy the the trip and so a lot of people going to another act actor monique they're like everything can't be a a, a struggle a fight because you're you're gonna tire yourself out you're not going to enjoy it you got to find another way to get what you want that's besides right besides making it a fight every single time and that's not to say that she doesn't have a valid point for a, a great fight, point. but you've got to have a different way of going about it. Is that what you're talking about? That's exactly what I'm talking about. And it, it's really up to you to find that way. Nobody just offers it. So you, it's trial and error, basically. But Monique, unbelievably talented, just and she is telling the truth. She's not amplifying anything she's right but it's how you handle that you know um i was it was between me and cuba gooding for um um a few good men and mm. um um i mean jerry Maguire. sorry i i was up for a few good men but uh but jerry Maguire was going back and forth me and him me and him and um you know we would talk all the time and the he got paid really well, but he still didn't get paid what certain other actors that had less credits that were not black, that were not black, uh, got. And, but he, you know, and it's a different situation with him. I mean, he grew up with a famous father, you know, Cuba Gooding senior lead, lead singer of, you know, everybody plays the fool with the main ingredient. So he, he hadn't really had to <laughs> suffer like some of us. <laughs> But and we always I always joke with him about that. But, you know, I mean, it all depends on how you grew up, what how you were shaped and mold before you get to, to this place where you want to be. And you, but you don't realize it till you're already in it. And, and like I said, Monique was telling the truth. Cat's telling the truth. Um, difference is cats protected a little bit so you can talk a little bit more. She's not obviously and you can't just even what is it uh the uh you the the um the speed limit can say 55 but that don't mean you need to drive 55 all the time sometimes you might need to drive 50 
or sometimes you might need to drive 70, but you got to control that. And the moment you don't control that is when they got you, you know, and a lot of things you don't need to voice. You just need to keep within your family of protection, so to speak. And then you kind of figure out how you want to pursue that and go out after that instead of just saying what you feel because you, it's American. I can say what I want. You know, I'm not saying she did that. I'm just saying there are people that do that without thinking the repercussions of that. So a friend of mine is a line producer, uh, uh, Patrick Coleman. He um, is a producer on a couple of shows and I interviewed him a couple of years ago. And one of the things that he said that he wished he had done earlier in his career was to um, um, advocate for himself, be right. more for himself because closed mouth doesn't get fed. We know that. So um, some of us, sometimes we're just so glad to be at the table. Sometimes we don't ask for the money. We don't do. Um, and when we do, um, we get turned down and then we don't want to walk away when we should just to let people know our value. So like you said, you have to pick and choose how you handle that. So if you had to um, give your earlier self, give your younger self uh, advice, what would it be um, to, to the young Silk Cozart who has was starting his career? What advice would you give to yourself and others who are coming up behind you? Well, well, first of all, I wouldn't just be um, infatuated with the limelight. I would learn the business side of things early, earlier, because it's show business. The business is bigger than the show. And if you don't take care of the business, the show ain't going to happen. And if it does happen without taking care of the, sh the business part, show's going to only last that long. So I, I would tell that young uh, Silk Cozart to say, you know, uh, uh, should have studied more in school, more business classes in college, uh, paid attention a little bit more, a lot more um, on on uh, on just how different people do what they do. And though that's a very strong thing for me, because when I got in the business part, I thought, you know, oh, a thousand dollars for this. Wow, that's a lot. That's more than I made, you know, when I was in school. And then people doing the same thing were making five thousand. And mm. so I had to learn why why they I mean, are they better than me? I mean, we're about the same kind of thing. No, they had a better agent. <laughs> or it's about positioning yourself to be in a better place. And it's not always about the money. A lot most of the time it is. OK, I don't care what anybody says. Most of the time it is about the money. I don't care what anybody says. But a lot of times it's about the project. And is it a good project for you to build on? Is it something that you'd be proud that your grandkids or your kids or your family would say, wow, I'm, you, wow, Silk, you did that movie? Oh, wow. That elevates you in on so many different ways. And that turns into monetization. You can monetize when you do good good work. You can't monetize bad work. <laughs> so, so is that why you is that why you started to produce your own um, projects? And what projects are you working on now? Well, you know, uh, I'll, I'll I'll say this: Bradley Cooper, wonderful wonderful actor, wonderful director. You know, they will give him a hundred million dollars to do a movie without any doing movies before that <laughs> with mm -hmm. me, they ain't going to give me a hundred million <laughs> Paramount and uh, Warner brothers universal ain't going to give me a hundred million dollars to do the Titanic. So knowing that for whatever reason, they, they do that with some folks and some, they don't it just depends. That's the way it is. Then you have to create your own, your own space. And people ask me, how do you, how do you get started? I want to make movies. How do you, I say, well, get a camera and start filming your dog or your cat or your aunt or your mom or your, you know, film a story. It's about storytelling. You know, if you keep it there, you'll learn more about the overall aspect of 
of the industry because it's all connected. You know, if you just focus on one thing, that's fine when you're when you're coming up and developing. But once you're in, it's so many different facets that will determine the outcome. So if you're not privy or don't even know those things exist, you're never really going to achieve where you want to be. But if you at least acknowledge and and put yourself in that arena, or you know, um, I love the fact that you talk to uh, you know your friends, a, a line producer. Most people don't even most actors. I guarantee you, ninety percent of the actors out there even stars okay do not know what a line producer does you give your script to a line producer first so he or she can line item oh you want to shoot an aerial shot you want to do it as a helicopter no that's too much liability use a drone so they'll cut that out that just saves you you know 100 grand you know so they will go through line by line item and tell you what the real budget of that script is going to be not some made up oh uh, it's gonna be 10 million what are you basing that on if they can't tell you where that 10 million goes they're just pulling it out of their uh, hat <laughs> so i learned to pay attention to those things on each category uh a gaffer most people most people in the business don't even know what a gaffer does a gaffer makes sure the lighting is exactly what the story is is about you know, if it's a dark story, it's lit a certain way. If it's a gigantic musical, it's going to be lit a whole nother way. So learn those things because they're all related. You know, once you know that, then your the acting becomes like a part of that instead of somewhere on top. You know, it's all a part of that fabric. And that's what I would, another thing I would tell a young Silk Cozart coming into this, it's all related, you know. So I don't know if that answers the question or not. It does. And you brought up um, drones versus helicopters and a budget. Now, I uh, started a drone company. So I will really? put this out there. If you need a drone for your productions, <laughs> that, I, I need to bid on that uh, that contract. And, okay. and I would love to be a part of your your productions that you're you're doing. Um, and also something else that you're doing is you started your own um, line of um, uh, adult beverages. So I'm yes. going to show people. Talk to us about why, what led you to start Silk Whiskey. Well, I wanted to start it start with a wine because I thought that would be kind of a good way to ease into that spirit world. <laughs> and uh, because Silk Wine sounded like it would be a good product because most people drink wine, everybody don't drink whiskey. And when I got into that, I thought, wait a minute, I started meeting people that had their own, you know, facilities and they had their whiskey or their product. And I thought, wow, okay, I want to be hands on everything that I'm doing. So I wanted to learn, you know, how long it's aged in those barrels, you know, and it's all about the barrels. It's all about, you know, having bourbon that's at least eight years, 10 years old, and then you can make the whiskey. So I started learning about that. And I attacked that the same way as I did the film business, you know, putting the right team, the right team around. And I learned very quickly that this business of alcohol is far more uh, diabolical than the film and music industry put together. So they, wow. they they literally tried to steal my name, C-Y-L-K. They literally, the people, <laughs> and, I, and you know, after I had it ready to be sold, I had to deal with that. And I had to basically sue the people that was working with me that I trusted. So I had hmm. to sue them, obviously one, um, but it was right when I had the, the bottles were ready, everything was ready to go. So I couldn't put it out yet. And in fact, I haven't put it out globally yet. We're getting ready to put it out now in just a little bit, but that, and the beer company, I have a beer company called, uh, country roads with Rick Clark. And, uh, he's in, uh, Charlotte, he's an ex NFL agent and, uh, NASCAR owner, him and Brad Daugherty owned, uh, no fear, um, NASCAR. So he and I share both the, the whiskey and the beer. Um, and now we're going to be a part of the ACC coming up. So all those ACC schools, 
um, from from Miami to Syracuse. You know, uh, uh, I think Clemson's going to be leaving this year. But all those schools, we're going to be the official craft beer. So that's uh, something that's getting ready to come up. Good for you. That's awesome. And I'll let you know where the whiskey lands. <laughs> so. You know what? Um, yeah, we need to talk offline. You, Katusha, and I. I don't know if you know uh, the Crooms. Katusha Croom. Heard that um, name. Well, she she did a lot of work with um, on the Monique show and Spike Lee. and um, she That's what we work. have in common, Spike. Yeah, yes. So um, School she, day. she's done a lot of work in Hollywood as well. So we've teamed up to start this um, podcast. And um, as I said, also the drone company. Um, so we will certainly um, keep in touch. Yes. I wanted to tell you before before the show's over, the reason, the main reason I wanted to put a an alcohol business together or, you know, whiskey, uh, beer, and I mean, uh, but is to finance the projects for movies and TV shows because uh, it's very lucrative once you get it out there. So I thought, I don't, I hate asking people for money to do a movie. Yeah, I'm not good at that. There are people that are really good at just that. That's all they do. They hook people up for funding. They take a small percentage and they go to the next project. I, it's just hard for me to say, oh, I need your money to do, I can make the movie, but I, I don't I don't like talking ask about money and stuff. So I just have attorneys do all that stuff or people that are really good at that. Uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer of staying where you're really good at and the things you're not, you got time to work on those. You know, don't but don't put yourself in a position just because you like that position, you know. So uh, that's a whole nother story, by the way. But that was why I I was I'm really excited about the beer, the Country Roads beer. You're gonna be hearing a lot about that. We're gonna be on game day, which is a big, one of the biggest uh, days in sports with ESPN. So our deal is with ACC and ESPN, uh, and Disney yeah. just happens to own ESPN and a, and they work with the ACC very close. So that's happening. That's a really uh, interesting um, uh, process, by the way. And you I'm, know I'm what? Uh, a lot of people, and I'm glad that you mentioned that, is that they think just because you're not in, you know, the top paid actor or you're <laughs> not doing something that's in the front forefront in the spotlight that there's not the business of you know you can make anything a business and because there's all me all processes that go on so That's just right. because they don't know your name doesn't mean you're not making money and providing for your family oh absolutely and that's so, a horrible misconception by the way i've actually had people uh, not so much now but in the early years they would come up to me like I did a movie called Eraser with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Vanessa Williams. And, uh, you know, maybe screen time, maybe five minutes altogether, six. I don't know. I don't, I don't really count the minutes. But um, I actually have people come and say, oh, man, it's sad that you, so bad you were in that movie only for a few minutes. Oh, yeah. You know, and I'm like, what does that mean? You know, I bought two houses <laughs> from that movie, just that movie. What are they, you know? You know what they have no idea you don't get paid for the amount of minutes you're in a movie you get paid for the what you bring to that movie and just because you don't know i mean such an ignorance that uh most the americans have i've been all over the world and it's really most americans have that kind of ignorance they don't leave you don't leave carnes you know you stay in carnes and you you're solving all world's problems right from carnes you know <laughs> I dang you, I don't know. here's what we're gonna do there buddy Here's what they got to do. I tell you, you know, 10 years later, you see the same guy in the same place. Yeah, well, here's what we're going to do. So, so I learned, you know, traveling, travel, go to Atlanta, <laughs> you know, <laughs> leave Knoxville. And then you can always come back. I came back to take care of my mom. That's the only reason I came back. And I was going to ask you why, why you came back. So you can't, you, um, family took care of you and now it's time to take care of family. That's once a man, twice a child. I um, there's nobody more important than your mother. No one. Amen. No one. No one. I, I don't. I mean, yeah, our fathers are real important. <laughs> they did a little bit, but you know, our moms. We come from our moms. All of us, not just the men. People 
come from a mother. There is nobody more important than that. So when, and my mom, I watched her metamorphosis, like I said, from a teenager to a young woman to a, a, an older woman and how boys treated her, how young men treated her, how men treated her all along the way. And I knew, I learned what not to do, what would never do, uh, you know, and, and I'm appalled. I'm absolutely appalled at people that don't communicate with their, their mothers when they're right in the same city or whatever. Now, I understand if, if somebody was abusive to you, hey, you got every right to, to not want to talk to them, whatever it is. But if you're just, you know, angry because they didn't give you an allowance or they didn't see you when you wanted to be seen and you're mad at them, what you, you know, that does, I don't understand that kind of thing. So when my mom needed me, um, she didn't tell me she needed me. I just, I, I figured it out. And I kind of flipped the script a little bit. I, I called her and I said, Mom, I need to come home. I said, Hollywood's, you know, getting to me. No, it wasn't. Um, but I knew if I said I needed her for anything, she would be like, what do you, baby, what do you need? You know, what do you need? So um, I wanted to make sure she was okay. She knew her son was here for her, not 3,000 miles away and could get on a plane, you know. Yeah, I'd rather live here and go to L.A. or New York or wherever I got to go than live in L.A. and come home every once in a while. So it's so fulfilling to me because, you know, sit in the house. She's got her own section in the house. I'm on. I'm in the other section. You know, I'm 60 year old, but I don't. She's more important. I don't need to go on dates. I don't. I've already had my dates. You know, I'm like my mom is the most important thing, and you can't operate at a full level if you don't think your family is okay or at least you're, you're you're helping to make sure they're okay and that's fulfilling to me so i started i had to start my, my production company here i couldn't i didn't have i don't have anything that i had uh, in la i had two assistants in la you know i had a driver and all that stuff because um you get more done if you're not driving you know nowadays so you know you, you spend three hours in in traffic in la driving but if you have a driver you spend three hours working while you're right. riding so it's just a practical thing for me and then to get assistance is very difficult because people here are not used to you know those spending that kind of money you know or making you know that kind of money so i had to make an adjustment there uh just for because and and i don't i wanted to make it clear i don't really have time to teach acting i don't but I make time for a specific class and for, for specific people that are really serious. And that's why I have to meet with them. I don't just go, hey, come to my class. Nah, you know, you, you, you know, I'm really specific in the work. And that way you get more done. They get more out of it. Um, it creates, you know, better atmosphere and work ethics, which elevates all of us. You know, so, uh, yeah, my mom, uh, that's why I came back. And then I think now she knows that I'm kind of just, I'm happy being home. You know, I like being on, you know, I still, the house I grew up in, I, you know, there's rabbits and there's, I saw a couple of wolves, you know, I'm out in the country, <laughs> you know, I got cats, I got raccoons, that dog, the dog lives in the house, raccoons and cats are all outside, <laughs> but there's no snakes around me. I don't want no snakes. So the cats, the cats patrol the outside of the house. The dog makes sure nobody comes in the house and mess with me and mom. <laughs> so you got it all worked out. Well, it worked I, out for me. For me, it does. And now my production company, I'm here in my office now. It's a musical uh, environment more than filming. So I just work with a lot of great musicians, a lot of great musicians here. Seva, he runs this place. It's just uh, Sequoia Studios. Uh, it's on Millbrook Pike, and it's just a Do Dolly Parton did a couple of her albums here, mastered, them. and Sava is like a, a a master recording engineer, producer, um, just unbelievable talent. And uh, so we we made a a deal to work together. I make a movie, I show the the screening there, and they, I say, get your great musicians, let's put some music to that scene or to this scene. I thought I just walk across the hall, <laughs> you know, and um, 
And if he needs something, they do a video. I usually I'll direct it or help them with it. Um, it's hard for me to direct just these videos around here because they all look like home home videos, and I don't I don't know how to do those. Things. I'm like cell phone. I mean, I'm used to you know a set, you know storyboarding it, you know, mm -hmm. and they don't even have any money to do it. They go, oh, I want you to direct my video. I was like, what's your budget? And they're like, budget, budget. <laughs> <laughs> it takes money to do it. They don't even have the money to um, to rent the equipment. I said, well, how do you expect to do it? And they were like, well, you're a producer and you're a director. I was like, yeah, but I'm not funding your project. <laughs> you know, I'm still trying to get mine funded. Anyway, it's it's um it's an educational progress here, as you know, as you very well know. And um, so, you know I what? Like when I come back, I live in Dallas. Okay. Um, when I come to Knoxville, because you mentioned mother uh, families and mothers, my mom um, recently had a stroke and I've been oh. coming back and forth to Knoxville. God uh, bless her. I'm going to say a prayer for her. Amen. I appreciate that. So the, I plan to be in Knoxville in the coming days next week, as a matter of fact. So I'm going to reach out. And if you're available, I'll be back and forth. I would love to see your studio. And then okay. maybe you and I and Katusha could sit down. And I know you're busy. So we'll try to, you know, make time we'll it it virtual. Yeah, we'll definitely work it out. So um, any parting words, I always ask at the end of my interviews, my conversations, is there anything that you want to share that I didn't ask? Um, Cause I oh. try to, you know, give everyone something that they can walk away with, but there's, you know, maybe there's something you want to share that we didn't go over. Well, I, there's a, a few things, but that might be another time, but you covered a lot of things. And I, my fault that I, my uh, being technically inept, I didn't know how to deal with that. I usually had a camera and then all that set up. But because of this, I wanted to make sure we hit that time frame because I'm in the middle of editing. Um, I would I would say that anybody that's listening that wants to get in this business, um, don't look at any of the negatives uh, so much as just the positives of what you want and put yourself in that arena. And, and don't be afraid to ask a lot of questions. A lot of people are afraid to ask questions. And I used to, I, I just ask questions because I didn't know. And then uh, when people say you ask too many questions, then that means they don't really have the answer. Why would you not want to have a discussion? So, you know, get that out of your mind. Anybody's thinking about, oh, I don't want to bother somebody. You're not bothering them when, you, when you're asking important questions that you don't know the answers to. So I would just, I would really, that's a big deal. A lot of uh, kids don't ask enough the right questions. So, and then put yourself where you want to be and, and, and reach out to people that you might not think you can get in touch with. I think we limit ourselves. There's no limit. That's what I would leave us with. And I appreciate that. I've been known as the question asker of my group. And so I'm with you on that. People are like, why is she asking so many questions? <laughs> because I don't understand. That's just She's that smart. simple. She's smart. So That's why. I appreciate that. So we certainly uh, will keep in touch. You have a great rest of your weekend. And um, if you want to know more about Silk Cozart and what he's doing, he's on Facebook and you can um, send him a message that way. Um, but I certainly will be reaching out to him and keeping up. With, so we'll, we'll have you back to talk about um, the developments of your current projects. Sounds good. Thank you, Stephanie. Right. I love your show. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Bye. So that was Silk Cozart. He was the uh, he is a an actor, producer, entrepreneur, and um, he was our latest um, K Town icon that we uh, want to talk to. Just so you can see some of the amazing people who started in um, Knoxville, Tennessee, and the surrounding areas. So if you want to suggest to Katusha and I who we might be able to um, highlight in our K-Town Icon series, then my name is Stephanie Rivers. My email address is info at stephanierivers.com. So make sure you spell my name right. 
Okay. Info at stephanierivers.com to find out more about what we're doing. So we want you to have a great rest of your weekend and we'll see you next time on K-Town Icon.